Greetings, everybody. Hope you're in good form. Time is precious. Want to crack on? Uh, I'll just show a few pictures to give you a bit of context. Hope you slept well. And uh, what a great blast it's been. It's been such a treat to be with you. I've absolutely loved it. I've loved the energy in this place, the vision, the sort of unity. The, I mean, it's all the more a treat, isn't it, having been starved of this kind of experience for the last few years. But, so hopefully a few pictures are going to come up on the screen. So this is, oh, you can hardly see it, can you, because of the, the light. But anyway, if you didn't know where Burundi was, that's where it is. Central Africa, south of Rwanda, where the red arrow is, the Congo. And next one. So that was where my home was for 20 years, and I miss it like crazy. Anyone get that? No. That'd be the greeting out there. Next one. And that's our charity, Transforming Burundi and Beyond. And uh, it ha oh, it's not the agenda, so I haven't shared that many stories about Burundi, but it has been amazing in terms of nation, nation shaping, transforming uh, experience of getting alongside. Our strap line is to identify, empower, and equip the best local leaders of passion, integrity, gifting, and vision for the transformation nation, bottom up and top down. How about that? And that's what we're meant to do, isn't it? That's what we're meant to do. We're meant to tell a better story, and that's what I want to be talking about this morning, us telling a better story than what's being offered to us. Next one. So that's what the whole area is known for, and I've experienced a lot of that. Gunfire, Shelling, bullets, death threats, all sorts of stuff. Very intense. Very different from Leicester, maybe, but I hope you're, you're getting a, a, a sort of the message getting through about the different bombs falling on you, different kind of war going on, but definitely a war that we need to be aware of. Next one. And so that's the book again, if you want to grab those. I don't want to leave with any books, so come afterwards and, and uh, grab those uh, on radical all in discipleship. And that's the daily devotional. So I'd love you to uh, wake up with me each morning reading that. Next one. You can hardly see that, can you? But that's my gang. So during lockdown, every Saturday night, we did a different theme. That was Mexico night. Next one. And just, I told the story yesterday, so I won't tell it again. But next one, that is grace. Beautiful grace. Next one, starting our life down the toilet and now ending up as our babysitter, as God wove the tapestry of our lives together, her graduation, uh, absolutely flying from the pit of a toilet. That is grace. That's the God of the impossible. That's her working with a bloke who took over from me. You know, he took over from me. I asked him five years before I left to, to take over from me, and uh, he didn't really intend to. He was, I mean, I'd say right now, he is definitely the most uh, influential man in the country uh, for the kingdom. But what happened was that I, um, I asked him to take over, and he said, yeah, maybe in five years. Anyway, meantime, there was a pastor who had five kids. They'd all, you know, gone very AWOL, and an S4 had been used to lead four of them back to Jesus and into leadership positions. Well, that pastor's going to be very chuffed, isn't he? So, so he fasted and prayed for 40 days to say, thank you, Lord, for an S4 and what you've done in my kids' lives. And will you give me some revelation for an S4? And in those 40 days, he called an S4 and he said, the Lord's told me two things. The first thing is that you have to leave what you're doing now. That was the first thing. And in the natural, he was running the most thriving ministry in the country, so he didn't need to leave. The second thing is that, and he didn't know me, this pastor. The second thing he's told me is that he's given you a twin to change the nation with, whose name is Simon. I mean, that's wild, isn't it? So I was able to hand on the baton, baton to a man that the Lord, you know, weaves our lives. The deal is full surrender. The eyes of the Lord. My favorite scripture, probably. Uh, what is it? Uh, two Chronicles, I think it mental blank. 16 verse 9. The eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth, longing to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. And that's what he wants from you. Next one. We can't get... Uh, Hunger, and if I tell you we're the hungriest country in the world, highest rate of malnutrition, 56% country malnourished, you can't get that. But you can get, you can get it from a picture like this, that blonde haired girl, she's my Canadian friend's cute little four-year-old girl, Alma, she's four years old, the girl in the middle, she's four years old. Or she was four, and she's probably dead now, and that's wrong. That's wrong. And, you know, pick a fight. There's loads of things wrong in the world, and we are called to be God's retentive agents of change, engaging now. And he's put you in Leicester. Most of you, you know, maybe a few of you, he's going to call you elsewhere. But that, this is your mission field right now. What does that look like? Next one. And I told these stories again. These are, we saw 10,000 people come to Christ. Next one. In the first two weeks of um, August, as we sent out those 700 evangelists with beautiful gospel stuff taking place. Next one. And then I'll just leave that up for you. If any of you want to follow, that's a benefit I'd get leaving this place, is uh, if more, more of you pray for our work. But you don't have to do that. But if you did, that would be a bonus. If you've got your Bibles, meantime, can you take out Matthew 5? Uh, sorry, Matthew. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 5. 
And uh, just one more slide, maybe, on the back. I think the last one is a podcast I do, which... Uh, can you say your own podcast is brilliant? I think I can because it's someone, and di someone else every week coming on it, telling incredible stories. So next, next week's podcast, I think, from memory, is uh, a lady... Raj, who was from Wolverhampton, and uh, you know, even when she failed to in her suicide attempt, her dad said, you couldn't even do that. And uh, then she went to prostitution, and uh, now she runs an evangelistic ministry. They're just beautiful stories. And it's all the pfft, bad news that we're hearing constantly. So if you want a weekly shot in the arm, they're stunning stories. And uh, I think we just need to hear some good news in the mix, don't we? So that's inspired on Apple or whatever. Um, good. So, Matthew chapter 5, you know, the, Matthew chapter 5 to 7, do you remember, it's the Sermon on the Mount, uh, condensed, probably, uh, recounting of Jesus, he's on the mountain, talking to that, those crowds of desperately hungry, spiritually hungry and thirsty people, and, um, and so I'm just going to look at, well, I'll start with the question, are you salty, and are you shiny? Two questions, are you salty? And are you shiny? In just after the Second World War, as the Iron Curtain <laughs> swept down across Europe, splitting East and East and Western Europe, um, communism is an atheistic religion, and they wanted to crush the church. And in Romania, what happened was that uh, they wanted to wipe out Christianity, and so a meeting was convened. Uh, of 4,000 priests, bishops, and ministers in the Great Hall of the Parliament building there. Church property was confiscated. Ministers were forbidden to work without licenses, which they had to get from the government, which they weren't going to get. And they, they convened these 4,000 ministers, be they Orthodox, Catholic, Protestant, whatever, under this great big portrait of Stalin, the Russian dictator. And under fear of imprisonment, and torture and death, one leader after another stepped forward and publicly, including it being broadcast live on national radio, declared their allegiance to the communist state, declaring that, they, that Christianity and communism were not incompatible, that they could work alongside each other. And sitting in that meeting was a Lutheran pastor, well-educated well pastor, a humble man whose name was Richard Wormbrand. And he, next, with his wife Sabine next to him, listened with horror at the compromise after compromise after compromise being exhibited by the spiritual leaders of that nation. And as yet another leader stood up to compromise, Sabine, what, a, what an incredible woman she was, with flaming eyes turned to her husband and said, Richard, stand up and wash away the shame from the face of Christ. They are spitting in his face. And he whispered across to her, if I do so, you will lose your husband. And she said, I don't want a coward for a husband. And he stepped forward. He asked for permission to address the 4,000 gathered leaders and his words being broadcast live across the nation. And he declared, it is our duties as ministers of the gospel to glorify Christ. Boom! That was it. That led to 14 years of prison. Three of them in solitary confinement where he didn't see a soul in three years. Mocked and scorned, forced to eat excrement as they made him take communion. They, I mean, start scars across his body. Being drip-fed information, Sabine, the wife, being told meantime that he was dead as they screwed around with all their emotions. Sabine sp has sp herself spending three years in prison, during which time their boy was left on the streets to fend for himself. What incredible suffering. Suffering for being salty and shiny. Are you salty? Are you shiny? That's the first story. Second story, and this is from Iran, and we, you know, we beautiful sufferings from Iran, which is the fastest growing in the church in the world, uh, fastest growing church of any nation right now in the world. And this lady uh, and her husband were very blessed, I think, to be able to escape from Iran and get to the promised land on some level, America, where there's freedom. 
Whereas in Iran, you can get kicked out of your family, you get put in Evin, famous, infamous Evin prison, you get tortured. So, you know, lots of raping. Uh, it's just horrific. And uh, after a few months in America, this lady said to her husband, darling, please take me back to Iran. There is a satanic lullaby in this nation. All the Christians are asleep, and I feel myself being lulled to sleep. Blaze my mind. She's saying that she'd rather leave the safety, the security, the comfort of a free nation and go back to a nation in which she will face risking everything because of the greater danger of getting taken out by the satanic lullaby. And so if you wanted to, a title to this talk, it might, be, it might be the satanic lullaby. I think that image is so very powerful. Because she's talking about America, and she's saying all the Christians are asleep, and clearly that's not true. Not all the Christians are asleep. Some of us here have been asleep. Um, some Christians in America, loads of Christians in America are asleep, but a lot aren't asleep. They're passionate. But we're not so different, England and America, on that level. And I, I think there is definitely a satanic lullaby in this nation, which I maybe have the advantage of coming from the outside from 20 years of Africa and coming and looking, flipping heck, what are people accepting as normal here, as followers of Jesus? So is there a satanic lullaby in the UK? Do you think there is? Can you hear it? Are you sleeping? Have you been sleeping? rock a baby. Ooh, it's not a very good singer, am I? But... Can we hear the lullaby? Are, we... Are you sleeping? I'm desperate not to fall asleep. So why share those stories? Let's, look, let's read today's scripture. So Matthew 5, 13 to 16. Jesus says, You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So are you salty? Am I salty? Michael Yusuf writes, It's difficult for us in the Western world, the modern world, to fully appreciate the value of salt in the ancient world. You see, Roman soldiers, their wages were paid in salt. Leviticus 2.13 speaks of the Mosaic law requirement for salt in all grain offerings. The, the Greeks considered salt to be div divine. And different theologians have highlighted the different attributes of salt. So its whiteness represented the purity of the holy believer. Or uh, as salt stings and open wounds, so were Christians to sting the world with a rebuke and re judgment. Or as salt added flavor to a dish, so Christians were to have the same positive impact on their society, or as salt creates thirst, so Jesus' people should create a spiritual longing and thirst in others around them through their attractive lifestyles. All those different pictures add to the mix, but probably the main purpose of salt that Jesus is really pointing to was it stopped decay. And in saying, you are the salt of the earth, he's calling on his disciples, he's calling on us to act as preservatives to stop the moral decay in our rotting culture. Now, there's loads of good in culture, isn't it? We celebrate it. God created culture. He created the arts. If you're an artist, feel very affirmed to serve God in that sphere. But there's a massive satanic lullaby that you're up against. And it's very hard to stay strong. And we need to support our artists in whatever sphere that is. And so people would have understood that. You know, without refrigeration, those fish that uh, had just been caught, they would soon stink and they'd be worthless. But if you salted them, if you prepared them in that way, they could be stored safely and enjoyed at a much later date. And our privilege, Holy Trinity Leicester, in Leicester, in Leicestershire, wherever you've come from, is to be salt. But he continues with a warning, Jesus does. He says, but if salt loses its taste, how would its saltiness be restored? Or how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trodden underfoot by men. Jesus didn't say we're going to lose our salvation, but he said we can lose our saltiness. And when salt becomes contaminated, it's poisonous and corrosive. And contaminated, contaminated salt can't even be used as fertilizer in a field, so it's just thrown away. 
on the road. It's a waste of space. And if we've lost our saltiness through compromise or apathy or indifference or fear, then Jesus' assessment is blunt. And if that's the case, a weekend like this is the chance to reassess and to not live under guilt or shame or condemnation. So please hear that loud and clear. But it can be a recommissioning this morning to get back in the game. To put a marker, fresh start, together, as family, as a couple, as, as, as mates, as a home group, as church, capital C, and to say, I'm going to go for it. And maybe you relate to that. Maybe you have been taken out. I've, I definitely, on some level, got a bit taken out during lockdown. And it was a fight to stay, stay salty and to stay shiny. So how are you feeling? Are you salty? Are you, are you, do you feel like you've, you used to be salty? Were you more salty before lockdown? Have you lost a bit of your saltiness? You wish you still were? Well, listen, there's hope. And I guess my context from a war zone was that it was easier to, to stay salty. Because when, you, when I signed up for Burnley, I clearly signed up to not be comfortable. That was a very conscious decision to not embrace comfort. And yet here we are living in what is a consumer culture, where it's, it is all about comfort. So I can wittingly or unwittingly settle for a consumer religion, a domesticated Jesus. And he says, no, he says, you know, if you're going to come after me, for example, Luke 9.23, you must deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow me. And, you know, let's be honest. Are we following Jesus or are we expecting him to follow us? On our terms, at our convenience, us setting the parameters of the relationship. Ouch, that's a painful question, isn't it? Yesterday, I talked about that blog I wrote on the curse of comfort. Do you remember, you know, going through a hell of a time out there in 2015 with the war? And I wrote, well, here it is. Here's a section of it. I just think it was, if I'm allowed to say, it was very well expressed. So just listen to this. There's a noble, so this is the curse of comfort. There's a noble defiance in worshipping God in the midst of grim circumstances. That's where the curse of comfort comes in. And I don't want to criticize Western Christianity, but as products of our consumer cultures, we invariably end, end up being conformed rather than being transformed in Romans 12 speak from yesterday. Acting as thermometers which reflect the reality of the environment rather than thermostats which set the very temperature and alter the whole environment. And thus we often, not always, we often unwittingly craft ourselves a more comfortable consumer cross and our whole worship experience can end up feeling shallow and anemic. And it's so easy to turn to, to, to Netflix or social media, or chocolate, or sex, or whatever, rather than to Christ. And it's no wonder why my most intimate corporate spiritual experience in the West have been with the most obviously broken people, tramps, alcoholics, prisoners, who don't feel the need to maintain the facade that their lives are all in order. And God doesn't love us sophisticated people more than them, or them more than us, but what they do have over us is discomfort. They've been stripped of the mixed blessing or curse of comfort. And in their brokenness, stench, and unpolished desperation, God is extremely close. And again this morning, God, know that God is extremely close. And all the more if you're going through a hell of a time and just hanging in by the skin of your teeth. He is extremely close. He loves you. He's journeying with you. He is faithful. He's got his eye on you. He won't, you're in that furnace being refined. It's not easy, but... He, he won't let you be taken beyond what you, can be be, what you can bear. And as George Bernard Shaw said, you know, God created us in his image and we decided to return the favor. And so the problem is, is that, you know, when you talk to someone, a colleague or a neighbor or something, if you ever get onto spiritual things, they'll say, well, for me, God is like this. Or to me, this, this is, and that's exactly the problem. They're creating a God in their image or to justify their own agenda or their perception of how things are. And their life choices. And so I get on a plane from Central Africa and I come back here. And it, it, is, it just feels like we're, we're on a different planet. And it is helpful sometimes to have someone coming from the outside. So let's look at ent ent entertainment. You know that picture of a frog in a pan of water. You know, it, it's, you put a frog in a, in a pan of boiling water, he jumps out. And by the way, this isn't true. But it's a good picture. It's a good illustration. So the, as the story goes, you put a frog in a boiling pan of water. And he jumps out because of boiling, it's death. But if you put that same frog in the same pan and the same hob, but with cold water, and you just turn it up slowly, he just sits there and he gets taken out. Now, as I said, that is actually not actually true. <laughs> Having used it for years thinking it was, I investigated it. It's not true, but it's a great picture. It's a great picture. It genuinely is. And it's a powerful picture 
of, of how I think we are in the Western culture. Or potentially we are, and that's why I feel really strongly about sharing this painful word this morning. Can you hear the satanic lullaby? When the wind blows, the cradle will rock. Proverbs 4 verse 23, above all else, guard your hearts. It's the wellspring of life. That's a very important verse because I think we let filth into our hearts. I think that what you consider okay to watch on Netflix today, 10 years ago, you would have thought, oh, that is gross. It would be offensive to the Holy Spirit in you because the Holy Spirit, what is he? He's holy. Or 20 years ago or five years ago, what we watch. And, you know, I turn some stuff on and, and, and it's like, oh, you know, it's a, it's, Hopefully, that's not prudishness or priggishness. And yes, we're to engage with the arts. But what's this doing to my heart? If you let cack into your heart, cack will come out. Above all else, guard your heart. It's the wellspring of life. I'm not going to say put your hands up if you watch any reality shows. But let me, let me just talk to you about, well, i share a letter I wrote to my sister. This is long out of date. This is in the early days of Big Brother. Okay? But things have only got massively worse since that day. But listen to this. This is a letter I wrote to her. And, and there's a happy ending in terms of how she responded. But, dear sister, I love you. And what may have started as a very legitimate social experiment four years ago has descended into something so pathetically base. And it makes me absolutely gutted that two of the people, my, my, both sisters, I love the most on the planet, want to, and I want to be proud of, can get sucked into this and consider it entertainment. Now, don't put this down to my faith, but... Of course, my faith does det determine my, my values. Put it rather down to my humanity. You see, I fear that, that you and the nearly 8 million people who are watching Big Brother, you're losing your humanity. Because if you stick people in a cage or in a house and observe them operate as animals, and indeed you create an environment to cause them to behave all the more animalistically, then your voyeurism debases you as well as them. You become less human. And ratings were plummeting, so what did they do? They lowered the ceiling to make it more claustrophobic. They put a camera on them everywhere. I mean, even, even when they went to the bog, I mean, come on. They get them all to sleep in one room with insufficient beds. They have people, many very weird, picked on their ability to wind each other up. Mmm, very wholesome. Now, I tried watching with you. I tried not judging. Although, why should I apologize for using brain, conscience, and morals? You've got as well. But I just couldn't stay. It made me feel all churned up inside. I wanted to cry. I wanted to scream at you and ask you where you'd lost any ability to discern what is legitimate amusement and what is sick. So I ask you, do you have any reservations about them flashing their tits and backsides, simulating oral sex, shaving their hairy butts, smearing their mammaries with jam and getting others to lick it off? vomiting, wrestling topless in the mud, having sex under the table, constantly swearing, and a whole lot more. Can you not see that you are victims of a tragically manipulative agenda of getting viewers at any cost to win the ratings war? Don't you think it's shameful? Don't you think it's wrong? Is there no such thing as right and wrong anymore? Now, in the cool light of day, when I sort of, in the cool light of day, when I just list some of the things from that one show, you're like, oh, I don't know, there's half of you sit through that stuff, I don't know, I don't know what the, what the statistics would be, but can you hear the satanic lullaby? Listen, this is very interesting. Co coincidentally, the first ever Big Brother was, was won by a Scotsman called Callum. Now, if you're, I'm 48, if you're sort of 48 and above, this is maybe... 2000, approximately. He, fun enough, was at the orphanage that Grace, he was a volunteer at the orphanage in Burundi that Grace was at. That's just a coincidence. He came back from volunteering at the orphanage. He appeared as a Christian on Big Brother. He was so winsome and wholesome and non-bitchy and encouraging that the nation loved him. But the, view, but the, but, but the ratings were rubbish. Because it wasn't lewd and crude and base enough. And the producers decided we will never, ever have a Christian again on the show. Now, can I say this with humility, but by directness? If you are watching Love Island, 
What's that doing to your heart? I could have brought, brought out a glass of clean water and a glass of my urine. I've done this before. And, you know, Jesus is the streams of living water. And yet, in Jeremiah's speak, we're drinking, we're drinking through broken systems. We're drinking sewage. How can you stay sharp for the gospel? Because the Holy Spirit just gets taken out. You don't hear his promptings, his inner workings, when you fill yourself with that kind of filth. Down will come, baby, cradle and all. So let's look at our culture. I'm not cherry-picking pet peeves or issues. Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, he addresses these. Look down at verse 27. Just a few verses down. He says, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, starts to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go to hell. <sighs> oh, Jesus, tone it down, come on. You know, he wasn't trying to win a popularity contest. You know, he spoke often of hell. You get very few sermons on hell nowadays. But he didn't shy away from it. Our culture nowadays scorns and derides the concept of hell as primitive and ridiculous. But no, the stakes are so high. There will be a judgment one day. That's the reality. And he outlines that, look, chapter 7, 13 and 14. He says, wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life and only a few find it. So Jesus first of all offends us with his insistence on the reality of hell. Then he comes out with a ridiculous pronouncements on equating you know, lust to actual adultery. That's absurd, surely, Jesus. But, you know, listen, today, 4% of people in the UK think that premarital sex is wrong. 4%. Does that make the majority right? I mean, Jesus and the rest of Scripture, it's clear that God's beautiful gift, he's not a killjoy, his beautiful gift of sex is for the context of a lifelong union between a man and a woman. Now, that's a tough stance to take in our culture nowadays. So if you're in a relationship, a sexual relationship with anyone who's not your, your husband or wife, then whatever you're doing, you're, you're actually doing with someone else's future husband or wife. Not yours. And, and pff, ouch, that's a high standard, isn't it? And the only way you can accommodate and justify your actions is to compromise and lose your saltiness and, your, and, your, and stop shining your light. But listen, as I said, God's not a sports sport. It's fascinating looking at social experiments of the past, satanic Lullaby experiments. So back in the 20s in Russia, or you know, Soviet, the revolution. So this is a Harvard sociologist, Professor P.A. Sorokin, in his book, American Sex Revolution. He describes the Russian attitude in the 1920s. The revolution leaders, and by the way, there's a lot of our society that is really ideolo ideologically pushing in exactly the same stream as this. And the ideological shapers of our society are, are not, I mean, will be left, middle, centrist, right here, we'll have that spectrum. It is the, the, the far left are the, are, the, are the shapers of our culture right now in terms of the arts and stuff like that. And I think that's controversial to say. But listen, the revolution leaders deliberately attempted to destroy marriage and the family. The legal distinction between marriage and casual sexual intercourse was abolished. P bigamy and polygamy were permissible under the new provisions. Abortion was facilitated in the state institutions. Premarital relationships were praised. Extramarital relationships were considered normal. But within a few years, millions of lives, especially of young girls, were wrecked. The hatred and the conflicts rapidly mounted, and so did psychoneuroses. Work in the national factories slackened. The government was forced to reverse its policies. You see, they were seeking to do everything to undermine God's created order of things. Are you salty? Are you shiny? There's so much confusion in our age, all around us, because we're in an age of complete moral relativism. People don't have a consistent plumb line by which to define right and wrong. Issues of, of, of gender, of identity politics, of sexuality, you know, all these are massively important and delicate. We need to listen well. We need to have humility. We need to be empathic. We need to speak sensitively and love consistently everyone with a love that doesn't condemn or judge. I mean, even in the sermon, again, chapter 7, do not judge or you will be judged. But neither, having said all that, does it mean we are to kowtow or tone down biblical 
orthodoxy and be bullied by that militant cultural Marxism I was talking about yesterday, that agenda into endorsing views that run directly counter to scripture. So I've got a friend, I'll call him Peter, and he was fired not so long ago as a chaplain of a school for something he said out off school campus in a completely different context for saying that his belief was that marriage was between a man and a woman. And a, a student heard about it out of context, reported it to the school authorities, and for that pronouncement of his conviction, he was fired. Now, he was, well, he was fired because he was called before the headmaster and he was told that he had to actively promote, actively promote an agenda that his conscience simply couldn't endorse. He refused and so he is dismissed. Now, that's nuts. You don't have to be a follower of Jesus to find that chilling. I mean, that's, that's free speech at its uh, 101. And if that's the consequence of not towing the land, uh, the, the line, and eagerly adopting this creeping Orwellian group thing, then we are in real trouble. rock a bye Can you hear it? So we've considered salt. Now, briefly, let's look at the complementary analogy of light. In verse 14, Jesus tells the disciples, you're the, you're the light of the world. Now, as salt, we're to counteract the power of sin. As light, our job is to make visible and illuminate. Not with our own light, of course, but with Jesus' light. Because what did he say? John 8, 12. I am the light of the world. So we, our aim is to reflect his glorious light in the world. Not putting it under a bowl, not being ashamed, but rather putting it on a stand to give light to everyone around us. Paul wrote in Philippians 2, 15, that as believers, we're to shine among them like stars in the sky. So Michael Yusuf again, he says, the Greek word used here is very similar to the word for a beacon that a lighthouse emits. And that beacon is bright and unmistakable in its purpose. It warns of danger. It directs to safe harbor. It provides hope for those that feel lost. And every day we are surrounded by people groping around in the darkness, separated from the God who loves them. Now listen, we're not better than anyone else. We're just better off. Because we've got a saviour. We're free from guilt. Hopefully, as I said, we're free from fear. Well, that's our birthright. We're marching the beat of a different drum. We know where we're headed. We know the end of the story. There's so many perks and positives. And that's what we're trying to share with others. Are you salty? Are you shiny? In the workplace, you know, where values of greed and running roughshod over people, profit being the bottom line, etc. What's it look like to be salt and light? Integrity at work. I mean, one of my mates, I mean, I can't do a podcast on him because he gets sued, but, but his, he, he, it, it's so stunning how he, in the city in London, it, I mean, he runs a company and... and because he's got such integrity, the whole city will watch him. He's well known. They're watching him, wanting him to fall to show that you cannot be a man of integrity in his line of work. All the banks were withholding loans, and three days, three days before declaring bankruptcy. But in the meantime, someone came and prophesied over him. Literally, a guy had come up to the street and prophesied over him that he was going to be used as a sponge to soak up the corruption in the city. And three days before declaring bankruptcy, because he wouldn't allow. Um, his, his, his programmers to be bullied and that sort of thing because he stood for righteousness. Three days before declaring bankruptcy, he, 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 he went to a meeting of the top bank, bankers in the world and he was up against two of the ten biggest companies in the world and the key decider said, we are using John because he's a man of integrity. And he gets a 20-year sexy, gorgeous contract, the biggest in the industry and everyone's like, righteousness, light shining. Now, most of us can't relate to that because we're not big, big city people. But uh, I think of my friend Ben, who, you know, pays twice the market rate to his 6,000 coffee producers, uh, coffee growers. Twice the rate because he's about empowering the, them and lifting them out of poverty. That's an example in Burundi. Maybe you can't relate to that one. Or how about my friend Annette? And she was on one of the podcasts. You listen to her, who's cleaning up the cleaning industry. Very skilled, very gifted. She decides to be a cleaner, which I suppose in, you know, as we judge people in society, that's not the highest... Uh, sort of rung on the ladder, is it? But she's like, all these cleaners, most, many of them who are Eastern European, and you know, they're away from their families, they are being shafted, they're being abused, they're not being paid on time. They're, they're, there's, yeah, there's definitely sexual trafficking in the mix. And, and I, am, I can speak up for those people. So I'm going to become a cleaner, I'm going to experience what it's like. And she's already been in the metro, she's been in the sun, she's getting some high-profile stuff. What, what does it look like for us 
to be people of integrity, to let our light really, really shine. Come on, whatever sphere you're in, don't lose your saltiness. Don't hide your light. Running out of time. Looking further at our culture, though, you know, that shallow materialism, pursuit of wealth, possessions, worship of celebrities, etc. It's just, it's just really weird, our value system. But we're conditioned the whole time. Unless you're aware, you are just that frog in the pot being taken out. And contrast that with a guy from the, down the road from me in Burundi. And my friend saw him, the lady actually who adopted Grace. Uh, she saw him, this internally displaced guy. She went over and sat next to him. He was in his empty rags, this old man in his 80s. And what's your story, old man? He told her how he'd walked six days having fled because his wife and kids had been hacked to death and his house burnt down. He had lost everything in his stinky rags with an empty bowl. There he was just praying with nothing left in the world. And at the end of this horrific, horrific story of woe, he turned to her and he said, Madame Missionnaire, I never realized that Jesus was all I needed until Jesus was all I had. And I come back here and we can, not all of us, but the danger is we, lots of it, we can have everything to live with and nothing to live for. And salt and light will mean recognizing people are more important than stuff. Relationships are what life's about. Everything is relationship. That's one of my key mantras. And we do this together in a fiercely individualistic culture. Individualism is not a Jesus DNA. We are interdependent. If, I love the African proverb. If you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. Holy Trinity, you want to go far, go together. Don't be a lone ranger. You will get taken out. You will get taken out. And Jesus, he looked at the crowds and he loved them. He loved them in their lostness. He wept over Jerusalem. He looked at that rich young man that he challenged and, and he loved him. And he let him walk away side. He didn't chase after him because he didn't give a soft sell. He said, count the cost. And you, brothers and sisters, you need to count the cost. He loves us too much to leave us the way we are, to pander to our own sort of views of how things should be. He said, no, because otherwise you'll just lose your saltiness and your light will be under a bushel. So how can we remain salty? How can we remain shiny? Well, this is Ivan Illich. He was an Austrian philosopher. And he was asked whether it was more effective to change society through violent revolution or gradual reform. And he said... Neither. If you want to change society, you must tell an alternative story. We've got to tell a better story. An alternative story, that's what I want to tell. One of, of, of hope, that's what we've been telling Burundi. I haven't got time for so many gorgeous stories. Can I sneak in one? Uh, uh, I, uh, you know... A while back, I'm, I, I hired out two prostitutes for a night. And it was really heavy. I was like, I'm going to lose everything here. This is a really dangerous decision. But I, anyway, I got them met in the hotel clandestinely. And I'm quite well known out there. So, you know, it could easily go horribly wrong. But I, I sat down with those girls, doled up with makeup. And, uh, and I just said, girls, I want you to have a night off tonight. I'm paying for your time. Stuff your faces. Enjoy a hot shower. Have the night off. I'll come back tomorrow morning. We can talk about you know, what, what life could look like with some better choices in the mix. Went home, prayed with my wife, came back the next morning. And, you know, do you think that those girls, when they're five years old, like my little girl Grace, do you think they, do you think they like, when I grow up, I want to be a prostitute? No. Of course, they'd fallen through the cracks. Some of us have fallen through the cracks. And by God, Grace, we, we're getting out getting back on our feet. But, you know, you know, of course, you know, they lost their parents, their six siblings to feed, that sort of thing. It was, it was Ida and Doreen. And uh, anyway, just the ongoing part of their journey is that now Ida runs a business and Doreen's married a pastor and had her own kids and they're both in discipleship groups and they're rocking it. And that's, that's beautiful, isn't it? That's the better story. That's a story that Jesus can do from anyone. He can do it with grace out the toilet. He can do these girls who've had to sell their body to keep the show on the road. He can do that with you. He can do that with me. That's, that's part of my story. And that's what we want to share, isn't it? A better story. Jesus said, I've come to have life and life to the full, life in abundance. A life of grace, of hope, of forgiveness, of sacrifice, a life of... Well, Galatians 5, you know, the fruit of the Spirit. Remember that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, etc. Well, love instead of polemic, binary, hate-filled arguments. 
And joy instead of relentless pessimism that we're getting in this culture. Dark despair and negativity. Peace, yes, deep, deep shalom peace. That's what he's offering us that passes understanding and still and stills us in our sort of challenging circumstances. Patience in our frenetic, sort of road ragey, aggressive sniping culture. Kindness instead of nastiness and malice and heartlessness. Goodness instead of cruelty and indecency. Faithfulness instead of fickleness and disloyalty. Gentleness instead of harshness. Self control instead of rashness and unrestraint. We've got a better story to tell. And uh, I think of a Zimbabwean martyr, and he wrote this, and I've just taken a little bit of what he wrote. It was beautiful. He said, I'm part of the fellowship of the unashamed. I have the Holy Spirit's power. The die has been cast. I've stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I'm a disciple of his. And I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice or hesitate in the presence of the enemy or pander at the pool of popularity or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I am a disciple of Jesus and I must go till he comes and give till I drop and preach till all know and work till he stops me. And when he comes for his own, he'll have no problem recognizing my banner. My banner will be clear. Is your banner clear? Are you salty? Are you shiny? Remember Richard Wormbrand? Remember him? We're finishing now. Remember Richard? <sighs> what a cost. What a cost. What a price he was willing to pay to remain uncompromised, to speak the truth, to hold the line. And holding the line, if you don't hold the line, you know, if we, if we start saying, okay, just a small veering at this point, you don't really notice it, but <sighs> very quickly, we're miles off course. And then how about that Iranian wife? Did she succumb to the satanic lullaby? I don't know what the rest of the story was. Did, did they go back to Iran? Or maybe did they resolve that, no, I meant to stay. I meant to stay in Leicester. And resist that satanic lullaby. And model something different. Sing a radically different, powerful, beautiful, graceful tune. You know, Christians have bumper stickers and slogans. Believers have creeds and promises. Disciples have scars and stories. Well, here's an invitation to move beyond Christian to believer to being a disciple of Jesus. We can't settle for bumper stickers and slogans. We're not going to last. We're not going to last. So let me close, Elaine, do you want to come up? Let me close with a, a Franciscan prayer. Why don't you shut your eyes and just listen to this. May God bless you with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, superficial relationships, hmm. so that you may live deep within your heart. May God bless you with anger at injustice, oppression, exploitation of people, so that you may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless you with tears to shed for those who suffer pain, rejection, hunger, war, so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them and to turn their pain into joy. And may God bless you with enough foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in this world. So that you can do what other, others claim cannot be done. To bring justice kindness to all our children and the poor. That's Isaiah 61 stuff, isn't it? The Spirit of the Lord has anointed me to proclaim freedom for the captives and liberation of those in bondage and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, all that stuff. So may God help us, brothers and sisters, to be salty and shiny. And if the saltiness has been lost and the light has faded, 
May he restore us so that we are truly salty again and our light shines gloriously again, all for the first time. As the verse says, that your light may shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. And all God's people said, Amen.